Hello, I'm Kirsty Young, and this is a podcast from the Desert Island Discs Archive. For rights reasons, we've had to shorten the music. The programme was originally broadcast in 2009. My castaway this week is the comedian and actor Steve Coogan. In recent years, he's found success in films, in roles as diverse as the 18th century fictional man of letters Tristram Shandy, to Manchester's best-known pop impresario Tony Wilson. He was a child when he realised he had a knack for impressions, and he first made a name for himself on Spitting Image. But he's best known for creating the grotesque Alan Partridge, a character so crass he had as peering at the telly through our fingers in mortified horror. Although his work has been very varied, it seems precious little about his career has been left to chance. He was still a teenager when he started planning his future success. I remember being in the sixth form one day, he says, having this moment of clarity, thinking there's a generation of future comics out there, all around the country, people who have no idea right now that they will be part of that generation, so why can't I be part of it? Other people out there don't know it's going to happen to them, but I'm going to see if I can make it happen to me. That seems extraordinary, uh, Steve Coogan, that as early as your sort of late teenage years, you were in the common room, were you, when you had that thought? Yeah, I remember it very clearly because um, I started thinking about all the people I admired on television, all the creative people I admired, and one always thinks that whoever's around now is that's going to be the status quo forever. And then, of course, you realise that isn't the case, and it never will be the case. Quite unusual to see those patterns at that age. I mean, at at this point in your career, you know, somebody who's had the amount of success, the sustained success you have, and you're in your 40s, and you can think, yes, I'm part of that generation, and indeed now, you know, you're a comedy producer and you bring on new talent. To see it at 16 or 17, though, seems uh, unusual, and and more than a daydream, much more precise than a daydream. Um, I was from a background where where there was a kind of certain sense of caution in what you did. I remember a teacher called me in and said, you know, thinking of going to drama school, that's a very very precarious profession and you might have a wife and children to support is that the wisest choice to make and there was a kind of caution about things what was your answer when they said that it sort of made me annoyed that to try and do something extraordinary was unwise but to be charitable to him I think he thought he would flush me out and if I really wanted to do it then despite what he said to me then clearly I was committed and why was it comedy at that point because I wasn't interested in football I wasn't interested in sport in fact when I did play football I used to I'd always play defence because I could talk to the goalkeeper who was very interested in movies uh, <laughs> like I was. I found I could do impersonations and I could entertain people, not not in a kind of a class clown kind of a way, but in a very sort of... Uh, with my little coterie of friends who liked our little exclusive sense of humour. It was a little bit elitist in a, in a good way, I think. I was part of the television generation, definitely. Mm. Um, most TV shows, if they were half decent, were an event because the next day in the playground people would discuss them and dissect them. And I felt part of that and connected to that. And this was even prior to the video cassette recorder. Yes, I mean, it was. So you used to hold a little microphone, did you? Uh, an, well, I, I, at first I used to uh, put a microphone on the cushion in front of the TV. In fact, I've got some recordings at home where you can hear me telling people to be quiet in the room while the TV show was on because I didn't want their voices <laughs> on some recording of 40 Towers or something. So I would play the tape back and then speak the visuals. I, was it still funny? It sounds as if you might have been sucking the life blood No, out no, the it, was quite, it was probably deeply unfunny, <laughs> but, but uh, people would say, did you see that thing the other night? Oh, it was, and try and describe it. Yes. And I would hear people do it and get it wrong and it would annoy me and I'd, I'd step into the conversation and say, no, it wasn't like that and I'd try to replicate it with accuracy. Let's take a break for some music. What's the first track that you've chosen? Uh, Susie and the Banshees. It was during the time when when punk rock was just emerging and I was a bit too young to go to the nightclubs but just young enough to be excited about its, its irreverence and its maverick status. And I still remember... Ordering season of Banshees from Boots, the chemist. My, my older brother told me to he used to tell me what to buy because he was the cool one in the family. I remember ordering it and putting it on the turntable for the first time and being so excited about this sort of energetic, different sound. <laughs> Thank you. 
Susie and the Banshees and Hong Kong Garden. It, it struck me, Steve Coogan, as you were talking about being this little boy with the microphone and placing it on the cushion, that there was something of the Alan Partridge in that. <laughs> talking people through the faulty towers and saying this is the bit where he goes to the bar. Sort of, mm. you know, dissecting mm. life into mm. its minute little parts and, and slicing up. Sort of train spotterish, I suppose. Mm. Um, mm. Do you think people mm. say that about you? Actually, deep down, he is a bit Alan Partridge. Um, there's things about me that I've sort of channeled into... Alan Partridge, but Alan Partridge was a collective effort. I tried to describe it as when I would speak to someone in, in conversation or meet someone, you have, or one has, private thoughts that you don't speak out loud. You edit mm -hmm. your thoughts and you say the appropriate thing. And I think I do think before I speak, but all I do when I did Alan was to remove that natural edit that people who are sensible and measured have and let your subconscious speak and try and make it sound reasonable. But uh, sometimes I would say things as myself, not trying to write Alan, and uh, I remember Patrick Marber just writing down what I'd said as myself, thinking that was funny, saying, just say what you said. And I'd be slightly insulted by the fact that he thought that what I'd said as myself it was worthy of Alan Partridge. <laughs> but I didn't mind. As long as what ends, ends up being funny and people enjoying it, then I didn't mind that. W were you comfortable with having, with the success of Alan Partridge, such a big character? I mean, I presume it, it must have changed your life radically in terms of the walking down the street sort of yeah, life that did. you had. I, in fact, I remember quite clearly recording the pilot of the talk show, Knowing Me, Knowing You, for radio. And I dressed up as the character, even though it was radio, and, Can you uh, remember what you were wearing? Yeah, I, I nipped to Lily White's to buy a Pringle sweater that was quite expensive, actually. A sort of golfing sweater. I've still got that sweater, actually. I've got sort of quite, I, I've got, but you're I wearing it today, which I've is got nice. I'm wearing it today. Oh, no, the cat's out of the bag. <laughs> yeah, and I've sort of got sentimental attachment to it, actually. But um, and I remember afterwards, Patrick uh, Marba said, you do realise, he said, this character that you recorded tonight is going to change your life. People are going to be shouting that aha at you. I remember thinking at the time, wow, that would be extraordinary. <laughs> what an amazing thing that would be. How many times do they shout out you a week now? So? Um, about twice a week. It's not, not that bad. It's quite a comfortable amount. If it stopped altogether, I'd be upset. But two or three times a week is acceptable to me, yeah. Henry Normal, who's been your writing partner and now indeed producing partner over many years, you, you run your company together, Baby Cow, says of you, um, Steve feels disconnected with the world. Comedy is one way he makes that connection. Do you think he's right? Yes. Yes, I think so. It's, it is therapeutic and cathartic for me, what I do creatively, and I need to do creative things. I feel comfortable when I'm writing. I feel comfortable when I'm performing, and I'm not entirely comfortable when I'm myself. But if you like, I'm comfortable with that discomfort. Uh, anything that happens to me on a day-to-day -day basis or generally in my life, I never see it, anything as a negative experience in, in a philosophical sense because I know that whatever happens to me is useful and interesting. Um, I do remember once, and this is a real, I don't know whether this is a vain actor thing, but something was happening in my life a long time ago, and I was, I was actually crying. And I remember looking across at the mirror and thinking, oh, that's interesting, that's what grief looks like. <laughs> as you say, it's a vain actor thing. <laughs> I think this is a good moment to stop for reflection, listen to some music. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me what you've chosen as track number two. Uh, Louis Armstrong, we have all the time in the world. Why have you chosen uh, this? I've chosen that because I love the music of John Barry. And to me, all, all the music of John Barry really reminds me of that cinematic escape. And Louis Armstrong's vocal on it is, is wonderful. It's the last thing he did before he died, but it's, it's timeless. It reminds me of this other world of sophistication and perfection that's slightly unreal but very comforting we have on the time in the world time enough for life to unfold all the precious things love has in store we have all the love in the world. Louis Armstrong and we have all the time in the world. Uh, Steve Coogan, tell me about your early world then. You described it as a, a sort of happy and normal and a large family. Yeah, I have four brothers and two sisters and my parents foster, did short-term fostering of children, sometimes two or three at a time 
in the house. So you live in a big house? It was, well, it still is. In fact, the, the nice thing is when I go home, I sleep in the bedroom I was born in, which is a really comforting thing. It was uh, fairly big, but, yeah, there was, there was always a lot of people in the house. I remember once a policeman came round because there was an accident outside or something, and there were lots of kids running around, and, and my brother used to cut people's hair, so there was a line of kids lining up to have their hair cut. And we had a pinball machine in the corner of the dining room and the policeman said is this a community centre he didn't think it was someone's house so that gives you an idea of the sort of it was quite a lively place and the way we lived we had like a tramp who came around once a week and sat in the hall and we gave him a cup of tea and a sandwich it was very welcoming sort of a hospitable sort of uh, house and a really sort of warm kind of environment to grow up in, very secure environment. Was it very secure? Because I can understand, I mean, the motivation clearly for your parents to put themselves uh, uh, through so much work. I mean, I'm sure it's a huge amount of work running a household with, with that amount of mm. children in it. Mm. One can understand that, but at the same time, I wonder maybe if as a child you were left feeling that you had to fight for attention. I, I, or... I'm not saying it was, it was a perfect childhood, um, but it's only when you're older you realise how formative your childhood is. Of course, purely statistically, you didn't get a lot of one-on-one -on -one time. I used to all my brothers used to stay at school for school lunch, and I would come home at lunchtime. And it's only looking back I realised it was so I could have just have an hour with my mum, on my, to myself. I knew there was a lot of love in the family, but it wasn't very conventionally demonstrative. It wasn't very touchy feely. I, I remember when I first started doing acting in London, I used to think, God, whenever I see my agent, I kiss her on both cheeks, and when I see my brothers after months of not seeing them, I just nod at them across the room. <laughs> But it, it meant that you didn't get a lot of attention. And yes, I was sort of a middle child. And the way to get attention was to say, look what I can do, get a load of me. I remember waking one of my brothers up in the middle of the night, tapping on the shoulder saying, do you think this voice sounds like Norris McWhorter? <laughs> do you think this sounds like him? And he'd sit up in bed and go, yeah, it does. Yeah, maybe a little higher, maybe a little lower. And then I'd go back to bed. Yeah. Let's take a break for some music. What's track number three? Um, this is my brother's band. <laughs> so he had his moment in the sun in the early 90s with a song called Can You Dig It. It reminds me of a very happy time in my life when his band was doing really well and I was just starting out and I was living in Manchester and I remember he was in the charts and he was on top of the pops and it was a very sunny, optimistic time where the whole of our lives were, were ahead of us. I mean, I've still got a bit left. Um, but it was that time where you're young and, and, and anything was possible. It's my favourite song he ever wrote and it's called Wicker Man. I had a friend who came The Mock Turtles, your brother, your brother singing lead vocals on yeah, that, yeah, Steve Yeah, he, he wrote all the music right. for the, the band. Wicker yeah. Man, he was singing there and reminding you of, of your youth. I read once that Patrick Marber, who, who you've written with and who now is very well known for being a, a, a playwright of very proper plays and mm -hmm. serious plays, mm -hmm. but has written mm -hmm. and produced a lot mm -hmm. of comedy. Is it true that he said to you once when you were complaining about the tabloids turning you over that it was you were just paying the fame tax? Uh, yes, he did, yeah. Um, Are you at home with the fame tax? More than I was, yeah, because the first time there was something in the tabloids about me, it seemed totally alien to me, because I don't read the small newspapers, because I want to aspire to be better than what you're supposed to be. I mean, I was, st I was first of all, I was just staggered that anyone would be remotely interested in my personal life. I didn't really believe, I didn't really understand that I was famous, and so it was a shock to me. I was naive. And how did you deal with it? Uh... Well, I don't think very well. Um, I took it all very personally, and uh, and I saw it as being just intrusive, and I was worried about people around me, people who aren't interested in that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. it, I felt guilty about people who are disconnected with having a public profile, as I have, being dragged into things. That that made me feel bad. I mean, I'm wondering about y your, your parents, you know, your good Catholic parents, who presumably were very proud of their boy for, well, the, the, for being on TV and, and being successful, then be, having to read about well, who you were sleeping with or who you weren't I sleeping think, well, with. Well, first, first of all, they don't read the tabloids anyway, but they know that things are in there. People often speak to them. But they are they're very tolerant, non-judgmental people which is basically how they've lived their lives. So when people ask me, my father, they say, oh, you must be very proud of your son. His response is always, well, I'm very proud of all my sons. Just because one of them happens to have a public profile, 
is in some ways neither here nor there. And I don't regard myself as a Catholic now, but I will defend it insofar as the notion that it's this sort of judgmental, unforgiving kind of attitude it certainly wasn't my experience growing up. It was about tolerance and humanity and compassion for those who are less fortunate than others. So if I was the subject of some tabloid story, they were very grown up about it, really, and not at all hysterical, as I was, but they weren't. You were hysterical. I was probably a bit at first, yeah. I mean, since then, the, the solution to anything that's ever happened to me like that, irrespective of my culpability, which I don't really want to go into here, but irrespective of that, my attitude is that I get on with my job the people in my life who know me and love me, what they think of me is the most important thing, not how I'm defined by people who don't know me. Mm. And given a choice between, if you like, engaging with people who write things about my personal life and trying to justify who I am, I'd rather people didn't know... I'd, I'd rather than say, hey, everybody, oh, I'm not like that, I'm a really nice guy, honestly, you should come and talk to me. I'd rather they didn't know who I was and misrepresent me then give them everything of me. Right. Let's have some music then. What have you chosen for uh, track number four? Uh, talking Heads and Nothing But Flowers. I love Talking Heads and David Byrne, who's another example of one of those people who are outside the ordinary. America gets a lot of flack these days in this country. People try to paint America as all a bunch of meatheads who don't know what they're talking about. He was, you know, one of those people who takes a slightly odd, unusual, sideways look at life and humanity and gives you this different perspective on things through the music. Talking heads and nothing but flowers. It's true, isn't it, Steve Cook? You, you auditioned for how, how many drama schools? Um, probably five, five in London. There's all, all the big ones for me. And what, what happened? I found it a truly intimidating experience because all the people who seemed to turn up there were all very middle class. That's going to sound like I've got a big bag of chips on my shoulder, which I probably have. I would say I've got chips in a tray with gravy on my shoulder. <laughs> um, lots of very friendly girls in dungarees with uh, ponytails being ever so friendly and bright and bushy-tailed, and lots of blokes called Julian and Sebastian who had these very so well-modulated voices, these ex-public school voices, and they wore long overcoats and scarves and had Byronic hairstyles. And they'd say things like, Hello, Roger, you know, you know my father, Algernon, he works for the BBC World Service. <laughs> and I think, oh, my God, I've not got a cat in hell's chance. Right? What did you look like? <laughs> what did you look like? What did I look like? Well, I looked like some teenager from the 80s. You know, that's what I was. And um, I joined this theatre company in Manchester after my school days and travelled around adult education centres doing sort of devised theatre before I went to drama school. And, and that actually gave me a bit of confidence in what I was doing and who I was and got me into drama school, really. And at drama school, I mean, it sounds like it was quite a golden time. Well, drama school gave me a lot of confidence because the people that I said I found intimidating when I uh, uh, auditioned at the London Drama School, I re started to realise that the things that made me feel um, slightly uh, intimidated and slightly inadequate, because I was, if we're going to talk about class, that sort of thing, I'm sort of a lower middle class background, I realised those things were actually my strengths. It's Be a, because? Because it's like whenever you see those 60s films with rather actresses trying to be northern, they'd say things like, He got our daughter in family way. You know, when they're talking about someone being pregnant, so I remember our daughter in family way. I think that's how I think Northerners speak. You know, she, oh, well, she's pregnant then, right? Okay. There was an interesting progression f for you. you. It's interesting you talk about these sort of floppy-haired people. I don't know if Armando mm. Yanucci even has enough hair for it to be floppy, but I certainly know that that was a time of solidification for you when you when you met some of those posher boys who'd been through the Oxbridge system. Yeah. Actually, they they did sort of seem to progress well, your comedy. Well, they they, they I mean. Well, Amanda certainly wasn't one of those floppy-haired people. But, um, but he's Oxbridge-educated. He's Oxbridge-educated, and he is a very clever man, says Patrick Marber, and all the other people on, on what was on the hour on the radio and day-to-day. -day. I had... But did, did maybe their more intellectual approach manage to bring yes, something yes, to what you absolute, were Absolutely it did. It, it really sort of opened my eyes, and I still remember reading the first scripts and thinking this was 
looked so fresh and different and yet f- making me laugh for reasons I couldn't quite understand. But it fascinated me. They sort of raised my game, there's no doubt about it. And they also gave me confidence because they thought I was funny. We'll talk a little more about your journey uh, in a moment, but for now tell me about your uh, next piece of music. Um, Next piece of music is Happy Mondays, Hallelujah, specifically because it's from the film I did with Michael Winterbottom called 24-Hour Party People, where I played uh, Tony Wilson, an iconic Manchester figure. There's a scene in the film where, as a voiceover, I describe Manchester. All the words I said as Tony Wilson, I could well have said, been saying myself about Manchester and how I felt about, how I feel about my home city. It encompasses everything that's industrial and yet creative and and poetic about my hometown. Happy Mondays and Hallelujah and good memories there, Steve Coogan. Of, uh, it was Tony Wilson you played in 24-Hour Party People, which was Michael Winterbottom's highly acclaimed movie that captured that distinctive period in Manchester's history where it was um, a hotbed of creativity for music and for art and, and for performance. I, I'm wondering how much you consulted him. Did you speak to him about what you were going to do? Well, I knew, I knew Tony before I did the film and... I read about it in the paper first. I read, I was Steve Coons to play Tony Wilson, read it in the paper. What, before uh, you'd been offered it? Yeah. And I rang Michael and said, read this in the paper, is it true? And, uh, oh, yeah, it is, we just haven't got around to asking you yet. Right. <laughs> oh, OK, then. It wasn't so much that I was desperate to play him, it was that the idea of someone else playing him and getting it wrong really annoyed me. And I sort of thought, I felt I knew something of who he was and all the things about him, all the sort of lots of contradictions about him. Again, someone who sort of encouraged people from lower middle class backgrounds to be creative. From your point of view, given that you had a history of doing impersonations, we haven't even touched on that. I mean, mm. you were the voice. Uh, uh, whose voice were you on Spitting Image? Who did I do? I did Neil Kinnock. I did Terry Wogan. I still did a very good Terry Wogan. But a nice radio voice there. It goes up and down all the time, like that. So, um, you know, I, I used to do Terry Wogan and I did uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger. Sylvester Stallone. Can you do Sly Stallone still? Because he's got the most distinctive voice. Well, he's just sort of. He's got a slight speech impairment. <laughs> slight. But, um, it's not. It's not my most ambitious work. <laughs> I'm wondering about the difference between when you do somebody who, who's real and you don't want to make it uh, overtly comical or a pastiche like Tony Wilson, and, and then doing these people. It must be. It's a different sort of approach, is it? To uh, well, to me, doing Tony Wilson to me is a gift because you don't have to research a character, you don't have to develop a character. He's spent 50 years doing it for you, and he was such an interesting, larger than life character that it was a gift to play. It wasn't like playing someone who'd done something significant but had no charisma. He was incredibly charismatic. Can we talk about your early gigs? I, w- I want to talk about your first experience, I think, at, at the Edinburgh Festival, where Frank Skinner was your support. I think. Uh, Is that right? That's right, yeah, 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 yeah. Nearly 20 years ago, yeah. Is it indeed true that he stormed it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. He, yeah it, it was a really depressing time for me and a great time for Frank. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, it was. We went to the Edinburgh Festival, and uh, Frank worked very hard. I didn't work hard, and I was doing impersonations, which I found a bit. It was just something I could do, and I got the review that said, uh, "It's funny how everyone remembers the bad reviews, but I'm no different." And it said, "Steve Coogan does a passable impersonation of a bad comedian until he comes on in the second half, and you realise he is a bad comedian." Um, <laughs> so, I was sharing a flat with Frank at the time in Edinburgh. And that he hid that review under the sofa cushion because he didn't want me to see it. And didn't it only get worse a year later? Were you not playing in Spain at a Oh, hotel? yes, not a, year, a year later. Sorry to remind you of all no, this. It's fine, it's, it's fine because it's, uh, I can look back and laugh now. Yeah. And I went and did some terrible, terrible holiday camp gig for a few hundred quid on at this hotel in Rhodes, Greece. I had a, like a box room with a view of an air conditioning duct and I read in Guardian International that Frank had won the Perrier Award in Edinburgh the guy had supported me the year before so yeah that was uh, I really felt like uh, uh, it's just down to you yeah you either sort of pull your socks up and do something or you don't and I, and I, I did piece of music what's next 
<laughs> this is Algar's Enigma variation. I think it's number nine, Nimrod. Why um, you it? I'm very sort of proud to be, I'm um, happy to be from England. And that gets a bad press sometimes because you associate it with sort of people with mastiff bulldogs and racists and such like. And I really am pleased that I'm from this country with all its faults and everything. I'm, I'm happy to, to, to be from here. But the best thing about it is that there's an optimism about it. There's an optimism about the future that I find really uplifting and really positive. So it's, very, it's a really comforting piece of music. Nimrod Elgar's Enigma Variation Number Nine. Uh, to listen to you talk, Steve Coogan, about um, your talent for mimicry, which sort of enabled your career to, to take off, you, you sound very dismissive of it. Is it because it yeah. comes so easily to you? Yes, I find it slightly embarrassing. It's all tied up with that class thing that we're sort of talking about. It's it's a trick, and it's not about using your brain. It's just about having a facility. So to me, it's it's lowbrow, and it bothers me to be associated with it. Is it important to you then? I mean, when you moved into film, and we've spoken about 24 hour party people, which was very well received, and then you did this uh, cock and bull story where it was the film of the 18th century novel Tristram Shandy, but it, it was very postmodern, and it exposed mm. a lot of the the petty grievances and jealousies mm. of the actors mm. uh, quite near the knuckle for mm. you. Yeah, yeah. Why did you want to do something that potentially people could say, well, is this Steve Coogan essentially paying him, um, playing himself, asking for shoes that are slightly more built up than the other character so he appears taller, annoyed when somebody gets a better line than him, well, flirting with the good-looking runner on set and making a bit of a fool of himself? Well, sometimes you see people playing themselves on, on things in movies and it looks like they're saying, get a load of me laughing at myself, aren't I cool? And I wanted to avoid that. But I also wanted to, to make sure it had some resonance, and I felt that playing uh, myself would work. But I do tap into things about myself that make me vulnerable, and that's fine. The only thing is, that my, my fear was that it would be too self-indulgent, which is not good. Are you satisfied with what you've done, or are you somebody who always has a sort of little bit of sand in the oyster? It's never quite as it should be. Um, I'm very, very grateful to be working, quite frankly certainly in this day and age and I never lose sight of that but yes of course sometimes you think well I'd rather do a bit of this or a bit of that and, and I, I don't think I'm attracted to, to a kind of discomfort I think that's what it is and certainly if I do a job if there's something about it that unnerves me or worries me or runs the risk of me making a fool of myself or getting it wrong and making a big screwing up in a public way it makes me want to do it so I don't know what that says, but it certainly it makes me feel like I, I can't be complacent, I, I can't sit back, so I don't like to take the easy option. And what about in life, in the rest of your life, if things seem to be right, do you have the desire to make them wrong? Well, that's quite clever. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. I just, no, I don't think that is the case. I just don't think I'm... I don't think I focus enough, probably, on my own life. That's what it is. I don't think I, I self-sabotage, particularly. Maybe I do. I don't know. I'm not, so I'm not vehemently denying that I might do that. I don't know. I need to talk to a therapist. In the meantime, while you search for their number, let's have some music. Okay. What, what have you chosen next? Uh, the next track is Joni Mitchell and California. I love the lyrics. I love the fact that it captures a period of time where young people were exploring Europe and the world was changing, and it brings something alive every time you hear it. And it takes me outside of myself. It takes me to another world, and uh, I love it for that. Oh, the rogue, the red, red rogue. 
dog. He cooked good omelets and stews, and I might have stayed on with him there, but my heart cried out for you, California. Feel good rock and roll band. I'm your biggest fan, California. I'm coming home. Joni Mitchell and California, and indeed you have this Californian life now as well. You you run your Hollywood life and you run a British life, and you you've done what some people might think is harder than actually having a successful career as a performer. You run Baby Cow, which is a production company that has spawned a new wave of comedy. Do you, do you ever feel worried that they'll overtake your comedy career? No, in fact I helped set Baby Cow up but I'm not really there for the day to day running, it's all done by Henry Normal I think if, okay. if, anyone, in the, if, any, if anyone in the office heard him say that I run Baby Cow they would just <laughs> fall about laughing Well it's uh, your company and we yeah. should remind people it, it, it's responsible for producing Gavin and Stacey The Mighty Boosh, Marion and Jeff, big shows mm, mm, Yeah. Mm. So you don't really have anything to do with it, you just take the money uh, No, I, I helped sell The Mighty Boosh to a very sceptical BBC right. uh, and staked my reputation on it which paid off on that occasion Are you a workaholic? No, when I do light work, I feel kind of um, equilibrium when I work hard. But no, I like to do nothing quite a lot as well, if I can. And but your, fa- your father to a teenager, your daughter Claire, is, is she... Th- uh, nearly, nearly a teenager. Right. Yeah, that's, that's uh, important to me. You know, being a parent is very, very important to me. Does she watch your stuff? Does she think it's funny? Um, not entirely. I'm a bit of an old farce, uh, <laughs> which I think is the way it should be. So uh, you have time for a real life. You're on the island, you're all on your own. How will you manage on your own? Well, in some ways, I'm very comfortable on my own. Are you? Yeah. Happiest uh, on your own? Um, I like... I think I'm maybe schizophrenic. I like company. I love company. I love conversation. I like being sociable with people but I also like equally like being on my own and not talking to anyone there was there's a place in Ireland I, I used to rent this cottage and I would stay there for days not speaking to anyone and if any car passed by I'd be thinking oh who's that person bothering me so I think I'd be okay let's have some music what's your final disc well, this is the Smiths and Panic I would see the Smiths at the Free Trade Hall in 1983 when I was 17 and Morrissey was 24, and he bought me a pint of bitter, which I will remember forever. And what I love about it so much is that their inspiration, they didn't have to look outside of their own hometown to find their inspiration, so they sing about things in their immediate surroundings. They found beauty and poetry in the ordinary, and, and that was inspirational to me. and panic and memories there of a man who bought you a pint when you were 17 and you went to see a Morrissey bought you a pint. Yeah, I brought it up with him recently. He didn't remember it, strangely. <laughs> Devastating. Uh, this is the point in the programme then when I give you the Bible and the complete works of Shakespeare, Stephen. You have to take another book. What book will you choose? Well, I'll take Lawrence Stern's Tristram Shandy because I haven't read it. Um, I never managed to get through it. I thought if I'm on the island, I'll be able to read the whole thing. OK, that's yours. And a, a luxury too. What will be your luxury? Um, my luxury would be a fully restored Morris Minor Traveller, the one with the wooden back, the, yes. wo- the wooden detail, the wooden frame, because it's a car that I spent lots of happy memories of childhood in, travelling back and forth to Ireland, and I'd want one of those with vinyl seats, and if it was a sunny day, I could get inside and smell that smell that only hot vinyl in a car has on a sunny day, and that would make me very happy. That's yours. And if you had to choose just one of the eight tracks, which one would you choose? I would probably have to be Louis Armstrong. We have all the time in the world. (laughs) Steve Coogan, thank you very much for letting us hear your Desert Island Discs. Thank you. You've been listening to a podcast from the Desert Island Discs archive. For more podcasts, please visit bbc.co.uk slash radio4. (laughs) Thank <laughs> you.